violent, perverted, cute, or bizarre. At the turn of the millennium, we had a limited vocabulary when it came to discussing anime. <laughs> These cartoons, marketed exclusively from Weird Japan, and packed to bursting with a unique strangeness, would use this decade to truly begin an earnest march westward. A West that was at once hungry for it, and totally unprepared. I think a lot of would-be fans remember this period well, where pulpy action titles were passed around on CDRs, and a bona fide cultural phenomenon was happening every week on Saturday morning TV. An age where an evolving video game industry went from hinting at an anime aesthetic to fully realising it. An era where the waves of Studio Ghibli, that crashed so loudly against domestic shores, began lapping at our own. But for any fan of Japanese animation, before, during, or even after that millennial boom, our most vivid memory will likely be both a shared and incredibly unique one. It's the exact moment that made you sit up, lean forward and ask, to no one in particular, what is this? This is one such moment. It's the story of the shows that made me the anime fan I am today, and the series that helped me take my first steps. Here it is, watch it, it is... Pokemon! On August 29th, 1998, my Saturday morning cartoons would be changed forever. My nine-year-old self watched in awe as a goofy kid from Pallet Town befriended an electric mouse. Pika. And effortlessly bridged a cultural gap in a generation of children around the world. Primed by pocket monsters, the turn of the millennium was an exciting time for budding anime fans. But many of us would watch Team Rocket blast off more times than we could count before we realised we were falling for an entire art form. Despite owning a handful of beloved bootleg Ghibli DVDs and playing nothing but anime-styled games on my Dreamcast, it wasn't until my first seasonal that I realised I was becoming a fan of a vast medium. In 2002, the internet, in its impossible infancy, allowed the savvy and the curious alike access to worlds beyond their imagination. Anime was one of those worlds. I was neither a savvy nor particularly curious teenager, but a new friend spotted the doodles of Jet Set Radio in the margins of my school books, and saw my potential as a brother in arms. I had idled at the boundaries of anime for years, but when he turned up a few days later, brandishing a CD he'd burned himself, I finally fell, or at least was violently shoved, into a lifelong obsession. With only enough megabytes to fit four episodes, that anime mixtape was nothing short of perfect. An incisive vertical slice of an entire medium but though it feels carefully curated in my memories, it was likely just a handful of favourites from that year. He told me about its contents at school. There was a promising ninja show that had just started airing. There was a weird one where beautiful angels are born from gross eggs. Oh, and a mecha show that's not as good as Evangelion, but at least the main squeeze is a knockout. I didn't know what an Evangelion was, but I, 
for one reason or another, made a mental note to check that one out first, until he primed me for the last entry on the disc. Dude, he said, with a sincerity that belied the rest of our conversation. Don't watch Chobits when your parents are awake. That caution is burned into my memories even now, two decades later, still infused with the sordid excitement I felt at the prospect of a show that demanded such a warning. Chobits, a show that would be considered quite tame today, but felt positively pornographic to my teenage self, would of course be the first show I watched on that disc, placed carefully into the family computer after my parents had indeed retired for the evening. That I was met with bubblegum J-pop and a colourful, cartoony art style didn't deter me. I knew what I was here for. <laughs> An unbelievably cute android whose power switch was located... Well... In the year 2000, four manga artists, collectively known as Clamp, created Chobits. A curiously collaborative endeavour, Clamp are an industry anomaly that have created some of the most enduring manga of all time. Their delicate artwork and fierce eye for fashion set their works apart visually, but it's their collective voice and storytelling verve that cemented them as industry legends telling disarmingly cute stories before pulling back the curtain time and time again on deceptively dark tales. Chobits was my first foray into their library, but it was far, far from my last. In the underachieving Hideki, we find our protagonist, a country bumpkin trying to make it in the big city. He's a lovable doof, with the social hang-ups you'd expect from a fish out of water and the lewd fixations you'd expect from a teenage lead with no luck in love. Surrounded by androids in the technological mecca of Tokyo, Hideki desperately wants to buy in to this new age of robotics, but simply can't afford to. Until, that is, he stumbles upon one lying in the trash and decides to take it home. Chobits released immediately following the international scare of Y2K, and the computer-induced apocalypse we never suffered. The attractive personal computers, or Persicoms, of Clamp's new world feels like a post-millennium overcorrection. <coughs> Chi, named after the only sound she is initially able to make, is a defective android seemingly riddled with errors, and a cute spin on the glitches and bugs that had us apocalyptically panicked mere months prior. At first, Chobits is content to deliver charming, low-stakes storylines revolving around the pair's new life together. Hideki's emotions and explosive reactions rest on a hair trigger, and it's a trigger the naive Chi is an expert at inadvertently pulling. It makes for a show that is front-loaded with brilliant humour and no small degree of fan service aided in both respects by a blossoming cast of fantastic side characters. But whilst figuring out what exactly Chi is, or why she was found in the trash, is secondary to storylines about her buying underwear, the show hints early, and often, that its priorities will soon shift, as the secret of the legendary line of Chobit's androids comes into focus. Chobits debuted the same month the phone of an entire generation, the Nokia 3310, launched. Our chunky mobiles were barely able to play Snake, and yet Clamp were penning a vision of the future that now, more than 20 years later, looks eerily familiar. <laughs> Our computers may not look like us, 
Not yet, anyway. But their intelligence is advancing at a terrifying rate. Our dependencies on them are deepening. And some are already pushing the boundaries of where those relationships can end. The questions Clamp innocently posed with Chobits seem to become more pertinent with every passing day. Initially, it seems disinterested in exploring much beyond the scope of Hideki and Chi's strange cohabitation. But slowly that focus pulls back, and Chobit's understanding of the new world becomes more complicated. Every character in its extended cast are deeply sad individuals, touched, tainted perhaps, by the birth of the Persicom. Whether attempting to replace what they've lost, or find something they never had, it's in their stories that Hideki's own naivete is tempered, and Chobits weaves beautifully heartbreaking wrinkles into its own optimistic tapestry. Despite this, however, the show never wallows in such sadness. The concerned expressions of its cast are fleeting, chased off their face by a smile or cheesy joke. That it remains bright, despite its intense moments of darkness, is perhaps Chobit's greatest trick, and indicative of Clamp's wonderful and warm style of storytelling. I instantly fell in love with Chobits back in 2002, thanks not only to the adorable Chi and her insatiable curiosity, but also its winning leading man. The bumbling Hideki feels, at first blush, like any other goofy harem protagonist, nosebleeds and all. But over the course of the show, his flaws are balanced by surprising strengths. A fiercely loyal and determined streak that always puts the needs of others before his own. It's rare in a harem anime that you can appreciate the magnetism of its leading man, understand why they found themselves surrounded by so many potential paramours. But the earnest and handsome Hideki earns those affections effortlessly. But, most refreshingly, Aside from absent-minded daydreams about the good-looking group Hideki has found himself surrounded by, the story is largely disinterested in this dynamic. Chobits only has eyes for the pairing at its core, and it's in this strange potential of man and machine that Clamp take their biggest narrative swings. Whilst the inconvenient placement of Chi's power switch has been joked about since its debut, this reductive take seems to miss the point entirely. Not only does Chobits have a lot to say about chastity and virginity, but beneath its surface-level implications, such a design speaks volumes about sacrificial love. Even in the sci-fi world of Chobits, man and machine should not go together. The compromise at the heart of the series spins tragedy out of an otherwise innocuous rom-com and deepens a relationship that could have otherwise been throwaway. This was it. This was my anime moment. The moment that caused me to lean forward and ask, to no one in particular, what is this? A show that had, up until this point, traded in surface-level smuttiness, took a step back and used those foundations to say something important. I think I fell in love with anime here. And not for its sartorial impermanence. Well, not just for that. But because it was simply like nothing I'd seen before. These shows weren't just pushing the boundaries of cartoons, and the stories that could be told in such a medium, but were pushing it against the boundaries of Western media in general. Anime surprised me in 2002, and it hasn't stopped surprising me ever since. Over 
Over the following years, I cut my own curious path through anime, at first shaped by my friends' recommendations, and then moving on to the indisputable classics of the medium. But when these wells ran dry, I dove into the grab bag of 2000s anime, rooted around blindly, and came away with a new favourite every week. My favourites, not somebody else's. It was a wild era to be refining your taste in. One day you're watching three orphans run a library, and the next... The decade was full of instantly memorable elevator pitches that have stuck with me in the years following. A book that can kill people, living porcelain dolls, come to life to fight to the death. A boy's hand is replaced with a girl. Sister kissing, sister kissing, cousin kissing, which is different, but not really. Anime immediately instilled upon me its nonchalance towards Western norms. That it lent heavily on its own set of tropes was irrelevant. Anime was different, and that was unbelievably exciting. It was just as willing to be slow and serene as it was over the top and absolutely ridiculous. Five hours could buy you an entire season of life-changing anime, or it could be just enough to watch a single fight unfold on Dragon Ball Z. In my first few years watching anime, I dedicated more time to it than I ever would be able to again. I tried everything. Everything. And whilst much has been lost to the fog of my memories, or soured as my tastes have changed, it's an era of storytelling that I still consider my favourite, packed with shows I hold dear to this day. I think about one of these shows all the time. My opinion on it has changed and evolved, as I have changed and evolved. I watched, week to week, as it aired in 2003. And, for its brief run, I cared about it deeply. Kimigana Zomu Ayan, or Rumbling Hearts, was the first time anime betrayed me. I fell in love with Kimi Nozo during its deceptive opening episode. In 20 minutes, the romantic relationship at its core had made more progress than most do during entire seasons. The quiet Haruka and the oblivious Takeyuki had been pushed together, pulled apart, and tearfully reunited in a roller coaster of an episode.俺と付き合ってください。今更だけど時間を戻せるならやり直したいんだ。嫌です。やっとその言葉が聞けたのに時間を戻すなんて絶対嫌。たとえどんな時間でも私にとっては大切なの。だから戻すなんて絶対
even now, that swell of music stirs something in me, and I find myself aching to fall under its painful spell once more. But, like all magic, it's an illusion. An illusion I'm about to thoroughly spoil. I'm not sure I would ever recommend Kimi no Zot. But, if you want to check it out yourself, please skip this section of the video. Romantic anime, and to some extent romance stories in general, move slowly for a reason. Once the I love you's have been exchanged, what stories are left to tell? What stories are worth telling? The speed in which Haruka and Takeyuki reached that plateau should have warned me that their story had only just begun. But I was young, and naive, and wanted nothing more than to watch their sickeningly sweet romance develop for twelve more episodes. In episode two, I got exactly that. They go on their first date. Takeyuki learns of Haruka's dreams of becoming a children's author, meets her family, and takes her to a festival. And, as the show draws to a close, the two make love for the first time. It's only in the episode's final sting that Kiminozo reveals some of its true intentions. Running late for a date, Takayuki arrives on the scene to see an ambulance peeling away. Growing more frantic, he searches for Haruka in a crowd of people rubbernecking the recent traffic accident. We know, long before we see the ribbon, what has happened. So too, I think, does Takayuki. But the bloody reveal still hurts. Three years later, the comatose, atrophied, and unrecognisable Haruka wakes up. Haruka! Kimiga Nozomo Ayan didn't betray me with this plot. Tragic love stories are commonplace, especially in the often melodramatic medium of anime. And whilst this might have been the first to personally break my heart, it's not why I felt so hurt by this show when it finally came to an end ten weeks later. As an inexperienced and immature kid, I saw Haruka wake up and demanded that Takeyuki had been asleep this whole time as well. That he had paused his life, sat vigil by her bedside, and awaited her return. Life, however, is not simple. It's messy, and ugly, and with or without you, it has the tendency to move on. Kiminozo respects the tragedy at its core. It understands, in a hundred little ways, how an event like this affects everyone touched by it. Takeyuki's life did not pause, but it did not proceed as planned either. Lost to grief, his career derails, his health deteriorates, and it is only through the concentrated efforts of Haruka's best friend, Mitsuki, that he isn't lost for good. Mitsuki and Takeyuki find comfort in each other, and when they emerge from their mournful malaise, they find they've built a life together. It's a good life. It's warm. And despite it all, it's full of love. Upon Haruka's revival, however, Kiminozo finally proposes its cruel gambit. Will Takeyuki return to her side? Or will he stay with Mitsuki? The 15-year-old who watched Kimi Nozo, who hated Kimi Nozo, in 2003, is almost unrecognisable to me now. 
That little miscreant not only rooted for Takeyuki to run back to Hadaka, but expected it. When Takeyuki realises, about ten episodes later than he should have, that his three years with Mitsuki meant more than his three weeks with Hadaka, I felt utterly betrayed. It took me years to realise that Kimi Nozo hadn't failed me. I meant it when I said I think about this show constantly, and as the years progressed, as I matured and I gained experience in the exact kinds of messy, ugly, adult relationships that Kimi Nozo focuses on, I gained perspective that drastically changed my feelings towards it. Being hurt, and hurting those you love, finding ways to forgive and be forgiven, striving to be the kind of person you can be proud of, and lying awake at night when you realise you've fallen short. I, like many of us, have a long way to go in such matters, and it's a journey I suspect has no end. The sincerity of Kimi Nozo's complicated relationships does some justice to those complicated notions regarding human intimacy, and is far removed from the saccharine and simple relationships we've come to expect from such storytelling. No, Kimi Nozo never failed me. My immaturity failed it. I think about Kimi Ganazomo Ayan all the time, without ever revisiting the show. My own experience has recontextualized it in my memory, reshaped its stories, and revealed new lessons. I know, this all sounds wildly pretentious. But as I said before, I don't even particularly recommend Kimi Nozo. It was likely a middling drama that many happily consumed and then, justifiably, forgot about. For me, however, it was the wrong show at exactly the right time. It helped reveal the absurd, beautiful and unbelievable potential of anime. I've carried it with me, used it as some sort of personal barometer, and been genuinely inspired by it to become a better person. It challenged, and ultimately, changed me. It took me years to realise it, but Mitsuki was the only choice. Why does the media that sticks with us, stick with us? What is it about a show or movie that ensures it will continue to ring in the ears, months, years, or even decades after watching it? There's so many factors that it can be hard to guess what will become formative as you're enjoying it for the first time. But... For a generation of teenagers watching Elfin Lead in 2004, I think we all knew this one would take up permanent residence and define our relationship with anime for years to come. Arguably the anti-Chobits, Elfin Lead sets up a familiar tale of an amnesiac houseguest capable only of saying her name, before pulling the rug out from under all of us by making her a mass-murdering psychopath with horrific superpowers. Chi's past was dark and mysterious in its own right, of course, but New has four invisible appendages that she uses to tear crowds of people limb from limb. In the show's unforgettable opening, her murderous alter ego, Lucy, struts, naked, confident and deadly, through a heavily armed compound that she turns to jam 
with very little effort. I won't be able to show much of it on YouTube, of course, though with a little imagination, the ferocity of this lettuce attack goes some way in showing how repugnantly violent the series can get. As far as memorable openings go, Elf and Lead might just have the crown. The horned Declonius are a strange evolution of humanity, quite literally armed with invisible and extendable vectors used almost exclusively for increasingly violent turns. Straight out of a schlocky B-movie, they rip and tear their way through every encounter. Their sole aim seemingly to prove the fragile composition of our mushy bodies. It's only when these mutants come up against each other that they encounter any meaningful resistance, and it's in these face-offs that the show becomes truly spectacular. A confrontation in a graveyard early on burned itself painfully into a part of me that never really recovered. In many ways, Elfin Lead was the exact kind of anime the medium's detractors were always terrified of, full of rampant nudity, shocking, bloody violence, and truly taboo themes. It cared little for subtlety. Indeed, every time the show introduces us to a new and vulnerable character, you can begin counting down the minutes until they meet their bloody end. I didn't know it when I first watched Elf and Lead, but Cute Girls Suffering is almost a genre unto itself in anime. Shows that sought to twist their myriad knives in increasingly predictable, but nevertheless heartbreaking ways, only to find beauty in that ugliness. It wasn't a genre I pursued with great interest, but I managed to find that beauty in Elfin Leeds' bloodletting, at least. Yes, it can be unbelievably cruel, but within that cruelty, it finds ways to be unbearably lovely in equal measure. This is the strange beating heart of Elfin Lead, and the reason it has endured in the consciousness of genre fans the world over, whilst its contemporaries seem to come and go. The centerpiece of Elfin Lead is undoubtedly found family, as our protagonist, Kota, opens his home to teenage runaways, murderous mutants, and horny cousins. He tries to find the good in all of them. Sometimes he tries to find the good in them a bit too much, but they provide a unique comfort in a world that feels increasingly broken and unhinged. The final piece of this strange puzzle a puzzle that never feels like it should fit together, but does so defiantly well, is the music. As atypical as the rest of the package, it's perfectly summed up by the pair of tunes that bookend each episode. One, a mournful Latin dirge, is used as a haunting leitmotif throughout the series. It sets a chilling vibe that seems to reverberate through every crushing development and explosive thrill. Its twin, however, is a cheerful, lively J-pop number, as if it wasn't preceded by 20 minutes of blood-soaked depravity. In this way, Elfin Lead marries its two distinct worlds. Violent outbursts that turn people's insides into outsides and overly familiar harem farce. And like that strange musical juxtaposition, it kind of works. It sells the series' unique ebb and flow surprisingly well, and both tunes 
have stuck with me over the intervening years. Every sour theme and bitter wrinkle make up a wholly unsavoury tapestry, so purposefully edgy that everything ends up a little cut by its close. But, for anime fans who found themselves defending against the very image that Elfin Lead so often gives off, it's strangely cathartic to give in and let its gratuitous nature wash over you. As often as anime could be sweet, or mature, or earnest, it was just as fun to watch it lean into its own mucky reputation, and be everything that everyone was always so scared of. Twenty years ago, I was handed a CDR, with four episodes of anime on it. In 80 minutes, I met a ninja that wanted more than anything to become Hokage. I fell in love with a robot that made all future waifu wars someone else's fight. I cheered at my first adrenaline fueled mecha battle, and grew still when confronted with a philosophical treatise on life after death. But most of all, I was told stories by storytellers I'd never heard from. I watched cartoons go places, do things, and simply look like nothing I'd ever imagined. I heard language and music that sounded so alien and yet so instantly exciting. Anime felt like a new frontier in so many ways, though truthfully it's taken the intervening decades to truly appreciate everything anime gave me, and would go on to give me, in a life coloured by it. I certainly didn't realise after putting that CDR away that my life had been forever changed, though I did wonder what happened next to Hideki and Chi, and thought of how exciting it would be to see Naruto become Hokage. It would probably only take another 20 episodes, right? In the decade following, I found so many favourites, with each year delivering something that changed how I perceived the entire medium, that pushed against naive notions of what anime could be. Those limits, of course, never really existed. Anime, like any form of entertainment, like any form of art, is instead defined by those that fight against every preconceived boundary, and by the eager audiences along for the ride. The most joy I've had with the things I love is sharing them with the people I care most about. To pass on a gift that I was lucky enough to have given to me so long ago. To excitedly tell others about amnesiac robots and melodramatic love triangles and rip and tear nudists. It's impossible to know how art will affect us, how it will land with the people around us. But anime is a gift, and it's one worth giving to others. So sit down and show Kiki's delivery service to your mum. Ask your friend, a friend who has never spent a second of their life considering volleyball, to watch an episode or eight of Haikyuu with you. Watch Neo Tokyo explode with the biggest group you can find, or hold someone's hand and cry over Clanad. Don't get me wrong, anime is a wonderful medium to lose yourself in, to walk its unpredictable paths alone, and to stumble across ever-increasing wonders. But it's important, every now and then, to send a postcard, to tell someone you wish they were there. You never know who will be up for coming along on your next adventure to take their own steps. <laughs> <laughs>